I know I tend to, whoa, there we go. Sorry, that's loud. I know I tend to oversell things. Uh, overstatement is one of my spiritual gifts. Um, but I don't think I could oversell 2 Samuel chapter 9. I just don't think I could do it. I'm so glad you came tonight. I, I really feel like through our Genesis and Samuel study, it's like mornings and evenings go together. When conviction comes, it comes twice. When con- encouragement comes, it comes twice. And we are going to get a strong dose of encouragement here, I hope, from 2 Samuel chapter 9. Uh, so let's look at this really quickly. I want to remind you of where we've been. Sorry, I need to get my notes right. Uh, we've been going through 2 Samuel. If you're new to the study with us, uh, basically everything you need to know about 2 Samuel you can find in Hannah's song in chapter 2, 1 Samuel. First and 2 Samuel is about four things. What does God do to the proud? Humbles them. What does He do to the humble? Exalts them. Who's in control? The Lord's the Lord of history. And what's God going to do? Bring a messianic king. And for the last few weeks, we've been seeing things get really good for David. So if you read 1 Samuel, things go really bad for David pretty quick. The Lord anoints him as king. He slays Goliath. And for the next 20 years, Saul tries to kill him, essentially. But as, after Saul dies and after a brief civil war is fought, David finally becomes king. It took 20 years, but the Lord kept his promise. And so if you think back through what we've been seeing, David is anointed king over Israel. He captures Jerusalem, which has been an enemy territory for who knows how long. He makes it his capital. He brings the ark there. He restores God's worship. He defeats the Philistines. He defeats all the other enemies around. He expands God's kingdom to the boundaries promised to Abraham and then God comes and makes a covenant with him and says I'm going to do something David amazing with you you want to build me a house I'm going to build you a house I'm going to build you a dynastic line I'm going to be in a special relationship with you and your children so that though they sin and they will I'm never going to cut them off because from your family from your sons I'm going to bring my son the savior into the world And he's going to rule forever. And that's what we saw in 2 Samuel 7 and 2 Samuel 8. We see sort of a snapshot of David's victories, the money everybody brings him in tribute, and his rule. And that brings us to chapter 9. Now, I may have said last week, last week is the high point of David's life. It's not. 2 Samuel 9 is. And so let's dig into this. It's just so, 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 so good. Okay, this is all about the kind of king David is. He is on the throne. God made this amazing covenant with him that's about the salvation of the world. All these promises are going to be fulfilled through his son. And look at what David wants to do. Look at verse 1. Look at the king's request. And David said, Is there still anyone left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? Now there was a servant of the house of Saul whose name was Ziba. And they called him to David, and the king said to him, Are you Ziba? And he said, I am your servant. And the king said, Is there not still someone of the house of Saul that I may show the kindness of God to him? And Ziba said to the king, There is still a son of Jonathan. He is crippled in his feet. So David is king. What do kings like to do? Think about kings in our world. What do kings in our world like to do? They like to take other things. They like to take new lands. Do we see that happening in the world anywhere? Yeah, we've been seeing a a king in Russia try to take a kingdom over in Ukraine. Um, That's what kings like to do. What else do kings like to do? Dress in fine clothes, right? Um, Make speeches. Campaign for their parties, senators and congressmen because an election's coming up in November. Right, that's the kind of thing kings like to do. They like to, to win great victories, make more land, aggrandize themselves. What kind of king is David? What does he want to do once everything is settled? Because that, that's where we are. No more external threats. Nobody's in danger of destroying the kingdom from outside. And all internal conflict has been quelled. So the kingdom is safe, outside and in. And where does David's heart turn? To more conquest? To dressing nice? To marrying more women? Where's hard turn? Where is somebody I can show covenant love to? You understand how unbelievable that is. Here here is the king saying, look, everything's safe. 
where is someone from Saul's family that I can show covenant love to? Now, who, who's Saul, by the way? The guy who tried to kill him for 20 years? The guy who chased him all over? The promised land? The guy who kicked him out? The guy who tried to send him on suicide missions to get him killed? The guy who lied to him? Who hunted him? Who let the nation fall apart in order to kill him? And David is on the throne and says, I've got to find somebody in his family to show kindness to. That word kindness, if you're an underliner, kindness in verse 1, kindness in verse 3, kindness in verse 7. That's the key word. It's the special word in Hebrew. You only need to know about five Hebrew words. Repent, shuv, right? Uh, we talked about uh, El Shaddai today. Here's one of the other you got to get. Chesed. Say it in the back of your throat. Chesed. That is about, that's a special word. It's a special kind of love. We have no English equivalent, right? It, it's a lo- word that means, it's often translated loving kindness, steadfast love. Really, it's, it's a love that we just, it's a God love. It is a love that keeps promises. It's a love that is all about love and loyalty to promises. You know, there's this time in the book of Exodus when Moses said, hey, show me your glory, and God said, forget about it. But what I'll do, I'll put you in the cleft of the rock, which we just sang about. And when you get hid in the cleft of the rock, I'm going to come by. You can't see me, but you can hear my name. Because a person's name in the Bible is synonymous with what? Their heart. And God comes by and says, the Lord, the Lord, slow to mercy, but abounding in hesed love. Hesed love. Hesed love. I am a God who delights in keeping my covenant promises and keeping my covenant faithfulness to my people. And that's what David wants to show. And Jonathan made him promise. And Saul made him promise to do this weeks ago. Why would they want him to promise to show Hesed love to their descendants? Maybe. Maybe. Did kings lose re-elections in the ancient world? If they did, they only did once. Right? Because the way regime change worked in the ancient world is that everybody's a dynastic king. And so I take the throne from my enemy, and in order to make sure nobody has a legitimate claim to that throne, what do you do? You kill the king and everybody else. So that nobody can make a claim. And so Jonathan, as he and David's relationship grows, he says, look, I know you're going to be king. And when that happens, promise me you'll show covenant faithfulness and not cut off my family. Three times Jonathan asked David to do that. And three times David says yes. One time Saul asked David to do that. And one time David says yes. And now that everything is settled internally and externally, what is... I was going to say, what does Jesus want to do? That's a, that's a good faux pas here. What does David want to do? I've got to keep this promise. Is there somebody left that I can show covenant faithfulness to? And then this guy named Ziba shows up and says, actually, I know a guy. Actually, I know a guy. I know there's one descendant left. And his name is, we'll meet his name in a minute. But I know where he is, and you can go find him here. So on the one hand, okay, you need to just start by thinking about the kind of king David is. Not a killer. Not an exploiter. But someone who, like God, delights in showing covenant faithfulness. Delights in being loving and loyal to his people and his promises. And so that's going on over here. Right? David's here. He's longing to do this. His heart goes out his enemies in this way. So David's here doing that. And now let's get to know the man Ziba is talking about. So let's look at Mephibosheth. We no- learned something about him in verse 3. And Ziba said to the king, right there still is a son of Jonathan. He is crippled in his feet. And the king said to him, where is he? And Ziba said to the king, he is in the house of Machir, the son of Amiel at Lodabar. Then King David sent and brought him from the house of Machir, the son of Amiel at Lodebar. Okay, now, David's looking for someone left 
to show faithfulness to, uh, to covenant faithfulness to, and now we find somebody. And we need to think very carefully about the kind of person we're introduced to. Uh, what do you know about Mephibosheth's family? We've already hinted at it a little bit. Is he from a good family? If by being rejected by God, consulting mediums, uh, seeking to kill God's king, letting the country fall apart, civil wars, disobedience, rebellion, like if that's your idea of a good king, a good family, man, Saul's from a great family. He's from a terrible family. Mephibosheth is from a terrible family. He is a member of Saul's house who was rejected by God, opposed to David, disastrous to Israel, and he loves mediums. You want to think about his family? Think enemy of God. Think enemy of the state. Think someone in any other country who would have been liquidated by now. What do we know about him? We know that he is a rebel. He is an enemy of God. He is an enemy to God and his king. Does that sound familiar to you? Is there anything in the Bible about being enemies of God by nature? Children of wrath. And what do we know about his condition? How is he described? Crippled in his feet. Do you remember the tragedy that led to his crippling? Go back to 2 Samuel 4 4. Just go back a few chapters, just a few verses, and we'll get to read the sad account of this. 2 Samuel 4 4. Would somebody read that for us, please? So on the day that the battle of Mount Gilboa was fought, Mephibosheth's dad and granddad died. Saul committed suicide. Jonathan died faithfully in battle. And when news came to Mephibosheth's home that Saul and Jonathan were dead, what did they do? They ran. Because they knew their heads are on the chopping block as being enemies of the state. Whether it's the Philistine state or the David state, they are in danger. And they run away. And as she's carrying, this nurse is carrying this five-year-old, what happens? She drops him. His head probably is hit. He receives a traumatic brain injury. And he is crippled in both of his feet. In the ancient world, what could you do if you were crippled? They have, yeah, beg and about nothing else. You couldn't do any sort of brain or spine surgery. Nothing like rehab. Nothing like a hospital, a doctor. We've got someone studying to be a nurse here with us today. Um, ba- most of the basic things like painkiller don't even exist at this time. He is crippled. They can do nothing about it. Crippled in both his feet. And if he's crippled in both of his feet, what can't he do? He can't run away from somebody who may want to kill him. He can't fight him, even if he can't run away. Can he go worship the Lord in the tabernacle? Why? Not not according to Leviticus. He could live off of the generosity of others. Let me ask you this. How many of you want to be generous to an enemy of the state? Right? Do you want to? take care packages over to the last surviving member of Saul's family? Hey, what will all David's friends think if you're doing that? Hey, are we going to do another Ishbosheth thing again? Are we going to have another Ishi moment? Are you going to make him king? Are you going to fight David again? I mean, under the best of circumstances, those who were crippled in the ancient world had to live off the generosity of others. But who wanted to be generous? Who would ever want to be generous to somebody like this? For whom generosity could get you killed or at least put you at odds with the current regime. He can't fight. He can't run. No, that's too public. You've got to hide this kid. Grandson. Right, you've got to hide him. 
right? Um, He's sick, he's weak, he's helpless, he's broken. He was injured by a fall. Does that sound familiar to you? Can Christ identify with people like this? You know, when Jesus was, was dying on the cross, he, he read out Psalm 22. Or he prayed out Psalm 22. We're talking about praying the Psalms. He, he prayed Psalm 22 as he lay dying. And in Psalm 22, he would have said this, I am a worm and not a man. He was literally crippled in both of his feet. Having nails been driven through them. Jesus can identify with people like this. And so can we. Even if we're whole bodied. What does Romans say? While we were still weak. While we were sick. Christ redeemed us. You know, his family's bad. His condition's really bad. Uh, By the way, um, you think Ziba's a good guy? you read the rest of the chapter, you'll know that David does a little property switch with Ziba. It seems as if Ziba has been protecting Mephibosheth as sort of and keeping him under house arrest. He's in bondage to, to Ziba. Ziba was a servant of Saul. When somebody needs to find a servant, somebody related to Saul, guess who knows where to find one? It's right here. We find out that this guy's got 15 sons and 20 servants. That he is tending Saul's family land. Tending as in getting rich off of it. And keeping Mephibosheth sort of under lock and key. He has essentially taken Mephibosheth's inheritance. Now we know Saul is lame. But Jonathan's not. And Jonathan had an inheritance for his son. And Ziba has usurped it. And Mephibosheth is in his bondage. He's a slave, as it were, to to him. He's a slave of a ruthless, cruel, oppressive master. And what about his name, Mephibosheth? You know what his name means? Names important in the Bible? They are. We've met a guy named Ishbosheth. That's his uncle who led the rebellion against David after Saul's death. Do you remember what Ishbosheth means? It meant man of shame. Ish means man, Boshet means shame. Do you see that same word in his name? Mephibosheth. What do you think that means? It does mean something, shame. It means one who scatters shame wherever he goes. Right, have you seen the, the, the Peanuts character? What's the Peanuts character that always has like bugs and smell come off of him? You know what I'm talking about? Well, who, is, it Lin, is it Linus? Pigpen. Okay, that would make sense, right? <laughs> It'd be a, I can't imagine not naming him that, right? So, so in one sense, and I know that's sort of a comic, comical thing, but that's what his name's meant to communicate. Wherever this guy goes, wherever this crippled man limps, shame goes with him. It's like a shadow that's always over him, that always comes out of him, that touches everything he does. His name means one who scatters shame or from the mouth of shame. So when you think about Mephibosheth's heart, his nature, his character, his essence, what is his heart? Shame. What is his nature? Shame. What is his essence? Shame. And where is he from? Where is he from? We're actually told Ziba knows where to find him. Where is he from? Lodabar. The names usually mean something. Oh yeah, they do. They do too here. The prefix lo means no. If you ever read the Ten Commandments in Hebrew, they all begin with lo. Low idols, right? No idols. Low graven images. No graven right. No graven images. This is the word for no, and the word for Debar means word, matter, or thing. This man of shame, who is an enemy of the state, who is crippled and under the oppressive rule of this terrible guy named Ziba, lives literally in nowhere. That's what that word means. Nowhere. He is a 
nobody, a shame buddy who lives in Nowheresville. What an unbelievable picture. You want to talk about a pathetic picture. And I, and I mean that in the sense of not in he's, he's lame, but rather our heart goes out to a guy like this. Here is a man who, who was, dro- he was a boy who's dropped at five, permanently crippled, forced to live off others. Who's he living off of? Rather, Ziba is living off of him. He's under his thrall and bondage. He's an enemy of the state. His name means shame, and he lives in nowhere. He's you, and he's me. That's a picture of humanity after the fall. And then comes the summons. Look at verses 5 to 6a. Then King David sent and brought him from the house of Machir, the son of Amiel, at Lodibar. And Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, came to David and fell on his face and paid homage. Now, Mephibosheth knows nothing about David over here. What is David looking to do? Show covenant love. Mephibosheth knows nothing about that. What he does know is that soldiers are at his house and say, come see, come with us to see the king. I imagine this has been a day that Mephibosheth has been dreading for years. It was never in his mind probably a question of if, but when the soldiers would come. And so they came. They knocked on the door. Somebody answered from Mephibosheth who couldn't get up. It's probably the, the Carathites or the Pelathites, those special bodyguards of David. You have to understand, that it's not like there's a courier service in the ancient world. It's not like you have police. <laughs> right? The soldiers come. The army comes and says, Mephibosheth, come with us. Notice they don't tell him why. And so Mephibosheth gets in his crutches. He's a married man with children. He kisses his wife. He kisses his children, and he leaves with them. Do you think he expects ever to return? No. He expects to go, see the king, and to be executed on the spot. And so he makes it to the king's presence in Jerusalem. That's where he is. He's in Jerusalem. He goes before the king's throne. This is where the judgments of the day were executed. He comes into the king's presence. It's, it's so, it's, it's heartbreaking. I mean, he, he probably hum, humbles in, hunches in with his crutches and Someone with two crippled feet probably can't bow down and prostrate himself well. So you can imagine just the awkwardness of him slowly getting to the floor, putting his head on the ground and paying homage to the king. What a moving scene when you think about it. What an unbelievable moving scene. Here is this enemy of the king. Here is this man of shame. Here is this... Nobody from Nowheresville who's in bondage to Ziba, a cruel oppressor who has lost much and suffered much. And he bows down to the ground, puts his head on the ground, and pays homage. And tell me, what do you think he expects to hear? How do you think this scene went in his mind over and over again on the long trip from his home in Nowheresville to the king's palace in Jerusalem. What do you think he expected to hear? Mephibosheth, you're going to be executed as an enemy of the state because you're a son of Saul. Mephibosheth, you are going to be executed for crimes against the states. Your relatives, not once but twice, have tried to overthrow the king. Mephibosheth, you know how this works. It's not personal. We're going to kill you here and now. But what does he hear? He hears his name, Mephibosheth. Right? And David said, Mephibosheth. Notice it's not saying the king. That's a really, I think, interesting detail. 
And David said, Mephibosheth. And he answered, Behold, I am your servant. And David said to him, What? Do not fear, for I will show you Hesed love for the sake of your father, Jonathan. I mean, can you imagine? Like over and over in his mind, he expects never to go home, never to see his kids. He's down on the ground expecting to hear the execution order. And David says, Mephibosheth, do not fear. I've called you to love you. I've called you to show you covenant love and faithfulness. I've called you to fulfill my promises to your dad and your granddad to you here and now. It's simply stunning. And look at what he says. I will restore to you all the land of Saul, your father. Isn't that marvelous? Saul's land is yours. All of it. No more Lodabar. No more Nowheresville. He gets to go back home to Benjamin, to his ancestral land, and he gets to take it over. And as you read on down, look at verse 9, I love it. Then the king called Ziba, Saul's servant, and said to him, All that belonged to Saul and all his house I have given to your master's grandson. And you and your sons and your servants shall till the land for him and shall bring in the produce that your master's grandson may have bread to eat. I mean, this is why we think that Ziba has been oppressing him. He's basically been getting rich off of Jonathan's inheritance. And now David says, thank you, Ziba, for pointing him out to me. All that used to be Saul's is now his, and you work for him now. What you meant for evil, I mean for good. All that you lost and more is yours. All your inheritance as Jonathan's son is yours plus the rest of your granddad's. And if that were it, it would be one of the most wonderful chapters in 2 Samuel, but we're not even done yet. Look at what he says. It's unbelievable. And I will restore to you all the land of Saul your father, and you shall what? Eat at my table Always. This man whose name means what? Shame? This man whose name means shame, who is an enemy of the state, who's a nobody from nowheresville, who can't help himself but's been crippled and abused and used by Ziba, this one gets to eat at this table. And have you ever thought about who he's eating with? King David. God's anointed, God's Christed king. He gets table fellowship with him. And David's children will be there. There'll be Amnon. We'll talk about him later. We'll learn about Tamar, who's described as being unbelievably beautiful. Second only to her brother, Absalom, for whom the scriptures say he was without flaw from the top of his head to the bottom of his foot. He's literally the perfect beauty. Next to them will be Joab, the, the muscular military general, the heroic conqueror. There'll be Zadok, the priest, and Ahimelech, the priest, one who serves in God's presence, the other who makes sacrifice. And every day, this nobody from Nowheresville who's crippled which in the ancient world is a sign of sin. It really embraces his name of shame. He is granted permission to eat at the table with David and this crew every day for the rest of his life. Can you believe it? I mean, it's, it's unbelievable. This doesn't happen in the ancient world except here. You know, when we come to the Lord's Supper which we do every week, we should remember this moment. Because what we're doing here is a picture of what we'll do there. When we will sit down at the table, 
Have you ever thought about who will be, be there with angels and archangels? With Gabriel and Michael? Seraphim and cherubim, prophets and apostles, the Lord Jesus Christ Himself, David, Mephibosheth, and you. And if that were the end of this chapter, it would be one of the greatest chapters in First and Second Samuel. But that's not the end of the chapter. Look at what he says. And he paid homage and said, What is your servant that you should show regard for a dead dog such as I? You sort of get how he sees himself and how he's been sort of taught to view himself as this shameful thing, not human thing. And yet he is granted permission to eat with the king every day. Then the king called Ziba and Saul's servants and said to him, All that belonged to Saul and all... His house I have given to your master's grandson, and you and your sons and your servants shall till the land for him and shall bring in the produce that your master's grandson may eat bread. I love that. But Mephibosheth, your master's grandson, shall always eat at my table. Now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. Then Ziba said to the king, According to all my lord, all that my lord the king commands his servant, so will your servant do. Now look at this next line. Just, oh, it's so good. So Mephibosheth ate at David's table like one of the king's Sons. Like one of the king's sons. What's remarkable about what we think about when we do in the Lord's Supper, we envision that day when we as believers eat with Christ. They are not like one of his sons, but as one of his sons or daughters. And Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Micah. And all who lived in Ziba's house became Mephibosheth's servants. Ha, in your face. I love it. So Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem, for he ate always at the king's table. Now he was lame in both his feet. Just in case we forget, that's who we're talking about. We're talking about the enemy from nowhere, from nowheresville, whose names mean shame, who was oppressed but now delivered. So what does Hesed love look like? That's what this chapter is trying to teach us about. What does Hesed love look like? It looks like a king who seeks and saves the lost, who shows mercy to his enemies, who rescues from oppression, who has compassion on those affected by falls, who restores lost inheritances, who invites the shameful to his table, and who makes them his sons and daughters. What does Hesed love look like? It looks like Jesus. And it looks like the gospel. And this is the gospel. This is your story. This is my story. Who we were outside of Christ and who we are in Christ. It's a beautiful picture. Great chapter. This is the best David ever was and the most Christ-like he ever acted. And I don't think you have anything more to say about 2 Samuel 9. Are there any final thoughts, theories, or questions about the chapter? Well, let's... Just his birth. Being, being, the wrong son can, being the wrong guy's son can make you guilty. All you sons and daughters of Adam. Right? I mean, look, you can pull this passage apart and see, you know, you can just see this is the gospel. This is the gospel. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your Son and for his work. We thank you for our King's Hesed love that's modeled here so well. And yet even what we see here modeled is just a faint shadow, a pointer, a sign 
to your son's greater Hesed love. Oh Lord, we are Mephibosheth. By nature and birth, your enemies. By action and choice, enemies as well. Under the thrall and bondage to Satan and sin, affected by the fall, spiritually not crippled but dead, nobodies from nowhere, destined only for the sword, but rescued by your Son. Your Son who takes back and gives us more than what was lost in the fall. Who invites us to His table and meets with us and fellowships with us there, even now at the Lord's table. And then again later, in the fulfillment of the Lord's table, in the new heavens, the new earth, in the wedding supper of the Lamb. Making us His own sons and daughters. Oh, we glory in Your Word. We glory in Your Son. We glory in Your Gospel, Your covenant faithfulness. It's expressed here and in Gethsemane and on the cross and on Easter morning. Would help us to love and trust Him more because He is worthy of it. It's in His name we pray. Amen.